Let's just follow that up with prayer as the praise team goes down. Father, you are God. And in spite of our difficulties, Lord, you have overcome. You've overcome by the... Um, by your own blood, by the word of your testimony, you tell us we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony. And Father, we pray that you give us the strength to do that. As we open scripture this morning, I pray that you'd speak to us. That you'd speak to us. That as I talk, that I'd be able to just not say whatever I don't need to say. And I'd be able to say and remember what you're calling me to say. And that uh, more than my thoughts, more than my words, your words, your thoughts would pour forth. But it maybe it doesn't even need to come to me. We ask that your spirit would speak directly to each person here and give us each person what we need. Maybe our train of thought drifts and you just teach us what we need. Father, I pray that your spirit would, would be so here. I invite your spirit here as you tell us to invite you in. We invite your spirit here and we resist the enemy. And you ask, we ask that you, Father, would be strong in this place this morning so you could speak to each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to open the book of James this morning, and uh, the series is called Death to Selfie. Uh, James is a hard book to find, so I'm going to let you page to it right now. Is death to selfie because, well, people like taking selfie pictures, and I'll talk about that more later, but really it's just death to self. It's a great theme for the book of James, sort of giving up on the things that are, are natural inclinations, whether it's uh, just to go through difficult times and complain, or whether it's to have inclinations other ways. Uh, and doing good deeds for God. It's also a great theme leading up to Easter, where we're invited to uh, slow down and think about things that are in our lives that maybe don't need to be, so we can die to ourselves and then rise with Christ like he did on Easter morning. So it's James, uh, Death to Selfie, and we're going to read the first five verses of chapter one on page 1,266. Everybody find it? All right. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. This is the word of the Lord. So we're going to look at that middle part of that passage more next week, but really we're going to look at verse 1 and verse 5 this morning and talk about who is James and who is Jesus. It's an interesting question to me because as I look at the book of James over the years, I mostly think about all the great quotes that come out of the book of James. Things like, you remember this phrase, right? Don't worry about what you're going to do tomorrow and say you're going to do this or that. But instead, what you should say, if the Lord is willing, the Lord willing, right? If the Lord is willing, I will live and do this or that. That's from James. Uh, also in James, there's this passage about the tongue, right? The tongue is a restless evil. With it, we praise God and curse men. Brothers, this should not be, right? That's out of James. Um, another one that's out of James that's meant a lot to me over the years, actually just the last couple of years, is, is this simple truth. A man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Deeply convicting, especially to men, Right? A verse I often quote is out of James that says, uh, if, uh, Confess your sins one to another, and he is faithful and just, and will forgive your sins and heal you from all unrighteousness. That's from James. So over the years, I've mostly looked at James and looked at these small verses and passages and said, Oh, that's deeply meaningful. It's been a deeply devotional book. But then, of course, I became a preacher, and I needed to figure out how to preach on the book of James, which is a whole other thing. And honestly, I've been trying to figure out how to preach on the book of James for about two and a half years. I've said I was going to preach on it a few times, and then had to back out of that, because God was uh, putting other things in my heart. But honestly, I just, I just didn't know how to preach it. Well, how could... All right, so... You go preach on the book of James, and then you see what I'm talking about. It's hard to preach on a book, and you've got to figure out the theme and how to go through it, and all holds together. So anyway, it's uh, taken quite a while, and I've had some help. Uh, most of the help has been from God and simply maturing a little bit. But also, Beth Moore uh, did a series on James, and a lot of the women here in church study that. 
So I have that as a resource. Uh, she did a great teaching series on James. And then at a classes meeting, maybe a year ago, uh, Brent Clatter is a pastor of discipleship at Ivan Rest CRC. And he talked about he loved the book of James, and he shared a few things. So I went and talked to him, too. And he hasn't preached through it, but he has taught through it. So I got some great insight from him on the book of James, too. Uh, the sermons, just in case you're wondering, the sermons are my own, uh, for better or worse. And uh, so, but those are some great resources that uh, have helped me figure out how to preach on this book. So this morning, we are going to talk about who is James and who is Jesus. And we're going to start with Jesus. We know a little bit about where Jesus came from. We know that he was born to the Virgin Mary. There was some angelic, prophetic uh, signs of his coming. We know that he, uh, he had to go down to Bethlehem. His parents had to go down to Bethlehem. He was born there. We know that shepherds came and saw him. We know that he was brought to the temple on the eighth day and circumcised. Um, Anna and Simeon were there. We know that uh, eventually he had to go down to Egypt. Probably before that, the wise men came. He had to go down to Egypt to escape Herod. And then for two years, and he went back to Nazareth. Grew up in Nazareth. And then we really don't hear much about him until he's 12. When he's 12, there's a story about they went down to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem, and he didn't go back with his parents, right? So it was this big family thing, and they're going back up to Nazareth, and all of a sudden they discover Jesus is nowhere around. They go back to Jerusalem, and he's there in the temple courts listening to and asking questions of the teachers, like he was one of them. They're like, what's going on? He says, well, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And, but then he obediently went back with his parents to Nazareth. That's really all we know about his childhood. It says he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men, but it doesn't tell many details. And people, we want details, right? So at some point, somebody made up a little book and they said, well, these are some stories that happened to Jesus when he was a kid. And there's some miraculous stuff in there. Um, one, of, one of the stories is he made birds out of clay and breathed life into them and they flew around. Another is he took water um, from three rivers and sort of gathered it together and kind of played with it uh, with his supernatural powers. Uh, kind of a nice story, but in that same uh, book, we sort of get the, uh, the, the angry, the self-righteous Jesus where people start to die because of his powers. You think, nah, that's not really the character of Jesus. Um, so it's kind of twisted like that. But we really know very little about the growing up experience of Jesus until he got to be about 30 years old. Then he engages in his ministry. Then we get a lot of information. But what happened to Jesus when he was growing up? What was that like? Well, I really realized for the first time this week in a, in a new way, what we do know about Jesus is that he grew up with siblings. He had brothers and he had sisters. Now, if you grew up in the Catholic Church, this wasn't taught, um, is say these people are cousins. And if you did grow up in the Catholic Church and that's a bit of an obstacle, please talk to me afterwards. There's some historical reasons for that and everything. I'll explain that, but I won't do it in church this morning. What we do know is that he had brothers. We know it from Matthew 13, verse 54. So in Matthew 13, 54, he's doing his ministry. Miracles are happening. He's teaching. He's getting the following. And then he comes to his own town of Nazareth. And uh, people are amazed. They're looking at him and said, where did he get these miraculous powers? And where did he get his wisdom, right? His dad was a builder, a carpenter. And uh, not that carpenters aren't wise, but you don't expect them to be able to teach and then to heal people, right? Now, who is this guy? And then this verse it's very helpful. The next verse is very helpful. It says, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary's son? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, his four brothers? And aren't all of his sisters here with us? Well, what does all mean? It's uh, more than one, probably more than two, at least three. So Jesus grew up in a family with four brothers and at least probably three sisters. And in those days in Nazareth, just like a lot of the world today, you don't grow up in this big house where you sort of are all split up and you have your own nice bedroom with your bunk bed and all the stuff on the wall and the sports memorabilia. You mostly grew up in houses that have two or th maybe three rooms. And uh, the sleeping arrangements are like, here's the corner of the house, that's where everybody sleeps. So you get to know people really, really well. And during the night when someone's got to get up and go to the bathroom, everybody knows. When someone has another issue, everybody knows. And so you get to know people really, really well. And so James and his brothers grew up knowing Jesus really well. They knew what he looked like. They knew that little wart 
thing on his face. I'm not saying he had warts, but you know that these people have imperfections. And he knew the intimate, they knew about that big hair that grew off that freckle on his arm. And uh, again, did Jesus have a bit? Uh, no, that's not my point. He knew Jesus' um, personality and his physical characteristics intimately. You know how when you know somebody and you see him walking a long ways away, oh, that's who that is. He knew his gait, what he liked to eat, the ways he acted at home, how he helped his mother or didn't help his mother, the way he responded in an argument, how he was with his hands they probably built together, maybe helping his father, how he was a, a, as, a, as a worker, as a builder. He knows someone pretty intimately when you grow up with them as their brother. You may not like them, but you know them really, really, really well. All right, so what happened? What did they think of him? In John chapter 7, it says, After this, Jesus went around Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. So he knew that he was under threat. People wanted to kill him down in Judea. He's up in Galilee, about 30 or 40 miles away. He's not going down there, because he knows that, knows that people are going to, uh, well, they're fitting to kill him, as they say. So, uh, what do his brothers say into this circumstance, into this situation? They, you know, they could have said a lot of things. Hey, Jesus, good idea about not going back down to Judea because they're going to kill you. Um, they could have said, well, you better be careful. We're going to go down there, and, but you stay here. Instead, what they said is this. They said, you ought to go down there so that the disciples can see, your disciples can see the miracles you do. He says, if you want to be a public figure, if you want to be a great person, you shouldn't hide like you're hiding up here. Go down there and see what happens. Uh, yeah, only brothers can say something like that, right? And they're, they're basically saying, go to, yeah, I know you might get killed, but you should go down there and really become the person that you're trying to be. And then you think, well, this could go both ways. Uh, maybe they wanted him to be famous truly, but then the next line uh, says this. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. They didn't believe in him. They grew up with him. They grew up with the Savior of the world. But they did not believe in him. And why? Uh, why didn't they believe in him? I think there's a couple different reasons. Um, I'm going to go back. There's a couple different reasons. One is, familiarity sometimes breeds uh, contempt. Sometimes it breeds uh, disbelief. If you grow up with someone, or even someone in your small town, is always a certain identity, it's hard to believe that they're going to be anything more. I don't know what it was to like grow up with Jesus as the perfect older brother, but I'm guessing it wasn't always uh, convenient or great. First of all, you grow up with someone who's perfect, and that can be irritating in itself. Any of you all have perfect older brothers, sisters, right? They're always perfect, and that's irritating in itself. But the really irritating thing about it for me is that it reflects my own imperfection back to me. It makes my own weaknesses, my own foibles, my own uh, ways of doing things even more sort of irritating because I'm not like that perfection. If I'm just imperfect and I don't know, that's one thing. But now if I have a model of perfection next to me, and I'm not, that's really irritating. So whatever the circumstances, whatever the reason is, uh, they, don't, they don't believe him. They don't believe him at all. And so by the time Jesus is doing his ministry, there's a separation between his brothers and him. Now I'm going to take just a bit of a detour and explain something, bring some uh, social science into this. In your bulletin this morning, there's a piece of paper, and there's a bunch of squiggly lines on that piece of paper. What this is, is this is a family genogram. This is not the Human Genome Project, this is a family genome project. And this is mostly a resource for you to take home because I recognize that many of us haven't ever looked into this before except maybe some uh, counselors or whatever. Um, so this is how it works. This is a family genogram. Usually when we describe our family to somebody in our family tree, we simply explain who is who. So who's married, who had the kids, who's the stepfather, who's the cousins. It just sort of all gets played out. And none of the details about any of these people get inserted into this family tree. So what a family genogram does is it uses these symbols to highlight the relationships between people in that family. And there's the uh, relationships. And then the next thing on there is the sort of living relationships. There's a lot of different ways people uh, can live together and not be married, which isn't a good idea. 
but it is what happens. And so those are described on there too. And the reason this is helpful is because if you know your past and identify it clearly, it's helpful because then you can mourn it and then you can be healed from it. But if you hide it, it's hard to get healing from that. So this is a way to help people go, this is my past, this is determines why I act the way I do. Anyway, you can find healing. That's not the focus this morning. The focus is what kind of relationships. All right, so this is how this works. Let me just use this. All right, so there's uh, two people. The square is the guy. The circle is the woman. Um, I don't know why they use a square for guys or in the round. I, my guess is that guys are sometimes blockheads. And women are more well-rounded, right? That makes sense. I didn't research that. That's just my theory. All right. So there's some symbols. The green stuff with the, the bubble in the middle is a healthy, happy relationship. They're in love. And I showed this to Marshall last night. She says, what is that, the baby? I said, well, maybe. First comes love. Then comes marriage. You know how it goes, right? All right. So that's love. This is a great friendship, strong bonds, uh, just a great relationship. The green is good. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. This could be a great sibling relationship or cousins or just great friends. This one with the dashes is just uh, isolation or distance, not necessarily anger or frustration, just distant. These are the cousins who you don't really know, maybe the brother who you don't really know that well. There's not animosity, there's just distance. This is the thing that uh, we say in church a lot, broken relationships, right? A relationship that was good, that used to talk all the time, and now there ain't much, except some pain. You guys, I have people in our lives that we used to be great friends with. Maybe it was dating, maybe it was other friends, and something happened, and even though there's a great friendship, that, that gap is just too big, and you can't get there. And you don't talk to them anymore, and they're still hurt. That's something of what was going on between the brothers of Jesus and Jesus. There's also this. This is the sort of distrust, discord, not good things going back and forth. There's some brokenness there. That was definitely going on between James and Jesus and the other brothers. And this is the sort of anger. The, this, this is the aggressive type of thing, relationships. We got anger. We're sort of in conflict with people, active conflict. There's not broken relationship. There's just anger and conflict. So uh, this really wasn't happening that much unless you, uh, maybe it was, but this isn't the main thing. But this does happen um, in families all the time. And then obviously there's a lot more uh, types of categories, but those are just some ones that I'll share um, that are part of this family genogram. So why do I, and then I'll just say this. So the benefit of this is that you can actually map out what a family looks like. And I don't expect you to understand this particular one, but you start mapping this out, you start seeing what happens. We went through this in a class in seminary, and it was incredible how much stuff came out of people as they talked about their families, and oh, that's why that happened, and this is why that happened, and that's why I do what I do. All right, so back to Jesus' family. Um, it wasn't that dysfunctional. But there was a separation. There was a disconnect. There was somewhat of a distrust and disbelief situation. And then, eventually, everything changed. Because after Jesus died, after he rose again, they believed in him. And James actually became the leader of the church. Remember uh, the other James? James and John, the other James? He was killed. Uh, Peter had to leave. And James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So what happened? How come they eventually believed? One thing that I've noticed is that death changes everything, doesn't it? You may have people in your life, you had people in your life, but when they get seriously wounded or have a near-death experience or they die, all of a sudden the veneer of all your frustration and anger and resentment to them just goes away like that. And all the love, all the strength, all the compassion, all the care just comes out of you. And you really know what you think of somebody when you lose them. And Jesus died. And at that moment, his brothers who had sort of goaded him on to going down to Judea would have realized that, yeah, we actually love the guy. And he's gone now. It changes everything. The other thing is that they would have had an opportunity to see Jesus' real goal. 
looking at Jesus, it seems like there was some frustration that he just simply wanted to be great. He wanted to make a name for himself. And all of a sudden they see his real goal really wasn't to be famous, to be great, but was to die. And there's something that changes when you see somebody who you thought had a bad intent, who you thought was kind of like uh, not right on point, all of a sudden you realize their true heart and their true intent, and you realize their self-sacrificial um, life, and everything sort of shifts. I had that this week, by the way, with somebody. Um, and I don't know if I should say this, but I'll just share it. I think it's okay. So Max Lucado, uh, anybody know Max Lucado? All right. He writes, and he does a lot of stories. He takes a scriptural story and sort of makes up another story. And it's kind of, it breaks the point, but it always sort of rubs me the wrong way whenever he does. I know some of you love Max Lucado, and you're thinking, how can you not like Max Lucado? I like Max Lucado, I just don't like some of his stories. They rub me the wrong way. But they're good. I'm not saying that. Um, but this week, he came out with a statement that said, you know, uh, there's a decency test. And he has three daughters, apparently, and when his, uh, pers their prospective boyfriends came and talked to him, he said, you know, I had a decency test. I'd sit down and talk to their people that were going to take his daughters out, and he'd interview them. And the basic test was sheer decency. And he says, one of our candidates, and you can guess which one, but I won't say it, um, doesn't pass that decency test. And it's just simply unacceptable. And all of a sudden, he wrote it much better than that. But all of a sudden, my, uh, my respect for Max Licato went from, eh, to, that is spot on. Thank you. Because it resonated with my heart. And so that's what happens. And so they see Jesus, and all of a sudden, they realize his true intent isn't just to be some highfalutin guy. It's to be the savior of the world and to live, to live in such a way that he died for the sins of the world. And everything changes. But then, he's gone. And that broken relationship was still there. And James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas would not have had another opportunity to talk to Jesus ever again. There's no record before Jesus died that they got to talk to him and sort things out. And now he's gone. And then here he comes back to life but there's still not an opportunity to talk to him. And then there's a passage that I've never seen before that Beth Moore pointed out. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking, and he's talking about this confession and how Jesus died and was buried and was raised according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter and then the twelve, and then read this. After that, he appeared to 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some had fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James. James. His closest brother. James, the one he had grown up with, probably playing with, working with, cooking food with, cleaning up with, arguing with, sleeping in the same area with. His closest brother. He appears to him and has a conversation. And I think at that moment, James would have had an opportunity to see Jesus for who he truly was. He would have seen him in the flesh as his brother, but also as Lord. He would have seen the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. He would have seen him as the Messiah. He would have seen him in all his glory in his new resurrected body. I've been reading in the Old Testament in our scripture readings that are back on the sermon re resource table about Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph? Joseph was kind of a younger brother. He had some dreams that he was going to rule over his older brothers. He goes off to Egypt. Eventually, long story, eventually becomes almost the ruler of all of Egypt. And his brothers don't know who he is and finally reveals himself to them. And they see him in his glory for the first time as the king, as the one who's in authority, the one who's in power. And here, Jesus is, here James is for the first time seeing Jesus for who he is. And that's why, in the beginning of the book of James, he says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say brother. He says bondservant. And that's why James taught other people to follow him. And that's why James could say, we are called to seek him. That's why James could encourage people to good deeds. That's why James could encourage people to seek wisdom. This one passage in here says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Jesus could have found a lot of fault with James, but he gives him grace. And James becomes a follower of him. This really sort of pops for me, is important to me, because it's easy to grow up in the church and know a lot about Jesus, but not really ever get to a point where you want to worship him. And I have been there. I grew up in the church, believed in God, believed in Jesus, but at a certain point, probably college age especially, Jesus didn't really seem that important to my life. God was up there. I believe that he did these things, but these were all sort of in the past, and I just, it wasn't that sort of impactful for me. And right now, uh, time and time again, I run into people that were part of this church, young men probably in particular, who were asking the question about God. You know, how could a good God do these things? How could a God of justice also be a God of love? And asking legitimate questions about who Jesus is. And what I long for is for us as a church for us, as we experience worship together, I long for God to reveal himself to me, to you, to our friends, to our family, wherever they may be, as Lord and Savior and as merciful God. Beth Moore points out, Jesus appears to those who need him most. And I'm just going to say these things. He appears when he's ready, when circumstances are ready, he appears when God decides and then prayer provides. Sometimes you've got to pray into this. Well, always. And every appearance is after time of waiting. But Jesus appears to those who meet and need him most, restoring relationships and bringing people back into a relationship with him. So let me ask this this morning. Who are you? And who is Jesus? So here's the genogram relationships. These are the songs we sing. We love Jesus. Jesus, I adore you. Take my life and let it be. Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. We sing these, sing, we sing these songs and friendship. Uh, Jesus, friend of sinners. And that's awesome if that's the relationship we're having with Jesus right now. But I think if we're honest, sometimes we have this relationship with Jesus. Distant. A little disconnected. A little isolated. Sometimes, if we're really honest, it's a little bit broken. And we're not sure we can trust Jesus. And maybe God's done some things in our lives that we think, I'm not really sure about that. Or there's some teaching in the Old Testament here and there. Where we, yeah, yeah. Talk to a lady on the, uh, at the food truck Thursday night who grew up in a church. And when she was about 12, she started asking questions. Questions like, okay, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Who'd they marry? And the teacher in her Sunday school said, be quiet. And then she had other questions like, how old is the earth? Or questions about Jesus. And the teacher said, be quiet. She must have been kind of precocious because they excommunicated her from the church when she was 15. And she hasn't gone back. I think the Spirit of God prompts us to ask questions. And when we don't allow those questions and don't seek to give good answers, people uh, walk away. And if you've got legitimate good questions about God, or even if they're bad questions about the route of your heart, ask the questions. There's answers so many of these answers I can't explain in 10 minutes and 20 minutes. They take weeks and even months to investigate and share. But it doesn't have to stay like this. There's this, distrust. And sometimes there's outright this. Sometimes we're angry at God because of what's happened in our lives. And I get that. That too is a legitimate emotion. But the question I want to ask is, who are you? And who is Jesus? And what's your relationship with him right now? He longs to heal. It's what he does. 
And so as we go into a time of prayer, maybe the praise team come up, um, I just want to invite us in a time of prayer. And I'll, uh, I'll lead us through some prayers. And I'd like to invite you to pray as you are led. Um, and again, as always, if you want to come forward while we're singing, you can do that. And afterwards, we'll have the elders up front. You can receive personal prayer too. So Father God, I first of all thank you for being a God who reaches out to us even when we're far from you. But I also want to thank you for the questions you put in our heart about you. And I even want to thank you for some of the, uh, the distrust and, and disconnect that sometimes we feel. Because Lord, I know even if it doesn't seem like it, Father, you're using those thoughts in our heart to learn more about you. If we didn't ever have that, we won't ask the tough questions about you and we won't learn about you. It would just be sort of at the surface. Father God, um, I pray that you would appear at the right time for each one of us. I pray that you'd reveal yourself to us. I pray that you'd set us free from our addictions to screens. I pray that you'd set us free from our addiction to self-entertainment. But I pray that you'd set us free from our addictions to just doing things that satisfy ourselves and but yet really ever don't satisfy, Father. Set us free, Father. We need you. Lord, set us free from our distrust of you and reveal yourself to us and just show us how good and amazing you are. Father, my words can't get there, but your spirit can. And I pray that you would appear at the right time to each one of us. I pray that you would appear to our friends, to our family, to our associates, to the people we see on the bus, to the people in our own home, and to us too, Father. We pray that you would appear to each one of us and give us a word, give us an encouragement that we need. Thank you for working through your brother, your earthly, physical half-brother, to speak to us today, to show us how to live, to show us how to walk, to show us how to obey. But I thank you that mercy does triumph over grace, and I pray that you, uh, mercy does triumph over judgment, and I pray that you would give us your mercy and your strength today, because we desperately need it, Father. But I thank you again for the signs of new life all around us, and I pray that it won't pass us by, Father. I think of that old <coughs> hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Lord, we see it, we see your moving hand in people's lives all over the place, Father, but I pray that you would not pass us by when we need you so desperately in a particular way, Father. I pray for particular things like Rochelle, Father. I pray that you'd heal her. I pray that you'd be with Leon, who's uh, recovering well, but I pray that you'd heal him. Lord, I pray that you'd be with... Uh, um, all the Vanderplugs that continue to deal with health and sickness. I pray that you be with uh, things that we don't share, the sickness of the heart, our sons, our daughters, our spouses, our parents, or whatever our needs are. I pray that you would not pass us by, that you would speak to us, that you'd appear at the hour we need you most, and that you'd be our God, that you'd be our Savior, that you'd be our friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.